All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to part six of the GM's Draft Pod. Um, a little bit later start today than we've had the last couple, mostly because, you know, demand. Uh, we haven't had people banging on the door to get on here and talk about the draft. Uh, part of that could be because we're in round four. Part of that could be because, well, we haven't had a lot of movement the last couple of hours. So uh, fewer trades, fewer picks. So uh, lots to talk about. But anyways, hopefully we're uh, moving again here. Um, Lions was on the clock here at 4.06. And it looks like he's either picked or traded said pick. But we'll catch you up. Um, as of where we were yesterday, we were just getting into the supplemental draft. Um, so let me pull up the draft since then. Um, so I believe we were cutting out just around the point where, uh, the Chargers had traded up for, uh, Breland Speaks. Um, we may have had some cooking show or other, uh, entertainment in, in the meantime after that. Uh, but then. Uh, Packers jumped in and auto-drafted Jesse Bates. Um, we had a bit of a four-hour delay at that point uh, to Jack Kishi, a linebacker from Tampa. Um, Dalton Schultz went 338, which I was a little sad to say because uh, he's been a target of mine in a couple of leagues. And one of the guys I was actually thinking about at 335 before I traded the pick. So I um, thought he would fall to me at that 350 pick, which didn't exist. But, uh, you know, good pick by Chiefs. Um, next up, the run on corners started again. Uh, the Ravens grabbed uh, J.R. Alexander, his boy from uh, Green Bay, since he is a huge Green Bay homer. Um, but that being said, uh, started that run again because we had Denzel at the end of the second. Um, but not much since then uh, until about now. Um, Titan stepped up and grabbed a D-tackle. Uh, Deadrian Senat from Atlanta. Uh, Lions continued the corner run, taking Mike Hughes. Uh, Bears, I think, got his first pick in this draft at 342. Let me go ahead and scroll up. He may have traded for a rookie, but I think this is the first rookie pick he's made. Um, anyways, picking up Boston Scott from New Orleans. Uh, clearly playing on that no, the uh, Mark Ingram news. Um, and, uh, yeah, we do have a confirmation at 406, so we'll get to that in just a second. Um, let's see. Next up, we have 343, uh, which took place uh, this morning. Um, Julio Scott from Baltimore, uh, wide receiver. Um, 344, Chad Thomas, the end. 45, Ravens uh, double-dipped on those Green Bay Packer corners, picking Josh Jackson. So between Jackson and... Alexander and um, Kevin King from last year. They're starting to really build up uh, that defensive back, uh, back four uh, to go with everyone's favorite safety. Ha ha Clinton Dix. Uh, again, my wife still doesn't believe that that's a player's name, but that's neither here nor there. Um, next up, uh, Chargers continue the defensive run. Kazir White, who I believe is related to Kevin White. So here's hoping uh, Kazir has better injury luck than Kevin did. But uh, he's with the Chargers. Um, Eagles took Azim Victor at 347. And uh, Chiefs took Derek Nandi at 348 as the last of the third round supplemental picks. Um, but like I said, we're at the beginning of the fourth. Uh, top pick of the fourth round was Jordan Atkins uh, going to Houston. Um, again, picked by the Eagles. The interesting piece about this is I believe it's the uh, Texans who, yeah, actually the Texans who have all of the Texans tight ends. So uh, Aikens was the one he needed to complete the set and does not get him. So it will be interesting to see if we see a trade happen between him and the Eagles in the next couple of days. Uh, there's a bit of a confusion with some of the picks skipped at the end of the third round of the supplemental and beginning of the fourth. Um, but Simi Cobbs goes to the Patriots at 402. I am taking Micah Kaiser, uh, linebacker, to the Raven, not the Raiders, the uh, Rams at uh, 403. Armani Watts, uh, safety, going to Kansas City at 404. Uh, um, I'm back on the clock at 405, taking Alan Lazard. And like I said, 406 just happened. Um, we don't have Ian on to play the sound, but um, 
I think it's the first quarterback we've had go since um, the first round, end of the first round when we had Kyle Oletta. But 406 coming off the board is JT Barrett from Ohio State going to New Orleans. So uh, I believe Barrett signed a three-year deal there. So <coughs> you have an opportunity to be potentially the heir apparent to Drew Brees, uh, but those of us who were Ohio State fans also saw him basically play running back at the position of quarterback. So um, he's definitely one of those interesting players that, you know, he doesn't quite fit the Drew Brees mold, but that being said, he's still in a potential high powered offense with, uh, with taking over for Brees once the time comes and with Sean Payton. So uh, I understand the pick, but that puts us at four Oh seven. Uh, Titans are on the clock. Um, talking through some of the stuff in chat right now, the big, uh, chat topic is around a tweet that Santi made. Um, Santi, of course, the owner of the New York Jets, is also a uh, an analyst for Dynasty League Football or DLF. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, back and forth around that, but otherwise, uh, just the basic stuff. Um, then going forward, going back a little bit more, if we take a look at trades, um, I know I was involved in a couple of these. Uh, of note, I'll try and just focus on those. Um, the big ones were, uh, let's see, from last night. Scrolling back. Do, 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 do. So we had from. All right. Uh, so there was a trade that I made with the Chargers last night where I moved back from 335, picked up 350 in its future third. Uh, as mentioned, 350 doesn't actually exist. So we ended up settling that just with the 403. So nothing to see there. Um, next, the Bears and Jets made a swap. Uh, Bears giving up Theo Riddick as the Jets try and supplement their backfield. Uh, Jets giving up Taylor Gabriel to try and uh, improve the Bears' wide receiver core. And in the process, the uh, Jets drop back from 431 to 548. Uh, so it's a bit of a trade-up for the Bears, but also – uh, helps them fill each other's holes there. Um, Steelers ended up buying a defensive end from the Packers, um, giving a 425 to get Brian Robinson. Um, then we have uh, my trade with the Titans this morning. Um, as people may have seen, I broke up uh, Andy Dalton near the end of the cast last night. Um, one of those pieces back I got was Latavius Murray. Um, I've turned that around and picked up the 445 this year and the Titans third round pick next year for Latavius Murray. So four million off of my uh, salary cap, which I enjoy, uh, plus that future pick um, and pick this year. And as a result, um, you know Latavius Murray goes over to the Titans who have Dalvin Cook. So uh, very nice. And then the Redskins training back uh, with the Chargers. Chargers giving up four twenty eight, four thirty four, four sixty, four sixty two, and five hundred one. Um, for the Redskins 346, um, as mentioned earlier. So uh, nothing nothing crazy the last, uh, you know, 24 hours or so, but it's been an active training market and an active chat, so can't, uh, can't really go against that. And then the second side of things is we knew, have a new Broncos owner. Uh, welcome, Brian, to the league. Um, hopefully you enjoy the, uh, the pods that we've been posting. Uh, the last couple of days to see what you inherited and then, um, you know, what we're taking going forward. Um, I don't know when he picks next, but, uh, again, he's got control of the team. And anytime you have a new owner take control of the team, there's usually a fun piece of, uh, fun bit of activity. So, uh, here's looking forward to that. But anyways, here we are at, um, the beginning of the fourth round and I'll take a look to see if anyone has joined me. No shocking. Um, I have one viewer. Thanks for that one viewer, guys. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, but do, 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 do. in the meantime, we'll just continue to, uh, think of things to talk about. So, um, as some might know, I'm uh, fun employed at the moment. Uh, quit my job about two weeks ago. Uh, long story short, it was one of those where, um, it was just not going to be a long-term successful situation for me to be working with that company. So uh, took the high road, quit, uh, looking for work, uh, which is going well. Uh, I've been applying you know, for jobs for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I have a couple of good 
uh, offerings on the horizon. So here's hoping something breaks soon. With that being said, I've got a little bit of time during this draft to be able to commit to situations like this. Um, so we've been able to talk about uh, Dynasty football a little bit more, been able to catch up on a couple podcasts, read a couple books, take care of some yard work, all this fun stuff that you want time for but you never quite have. Um, but, again, it's uh, it's a give and take because, you know, at some point I'm going to get bored of, of being out of work. So uh, that's a little bit, a little bit about me. Um, as we take a look at the draft here, uh, like I said, we're in that fourth round. We did the first round of um, supplemental picks in that third. Uh, I think there were about 16 total in the third, uh, but the fourth, that number jumps relatively dramatically. So if I jump to the draft report here, we have fourth round picks going to um, 462. So another 30 picks of supplemental picks in the fourth. So um, whereas it was about a half round in the third, it's almost a full round uh, of extra picks in the fourth before we get to that fifth round pick. So something to keep in mind as you trade for those future uh, fourths, future fifths, um, there could be a bit of a gap between those. Or I think there's been some good discussion this offseason about trying to soften the uh, approach towards supplemental picks. But, again, we'll see what happens as a result. Um, Flipping back to chat here, uh, the debate continues uh, between Lewis and the Jets around. uh, So, again, just to to give a little bit of clarity for those who haven't been following chat all day. um, Like I said, uh, Santi, uh, a.k.a. Anthony, a.k.a. owner of the Jets, uh, is a analyst for... um, Dynasty League football, and made a post earlier today, which I think makes a good point of don't ever, you know, super pay up for a running back at any point. Um, I think it's one of those where it's a contrarian take compared to uh, what seems to be the popular opinion these days of running backs are king. I think zero RB is going through some uh, some adjustments and some evolution, but one of those things is don't screw pay up. And the, the point Santi was making is if you took a look at um, a top 10 running back list from 2015, uh, really no one except for maybe one or two of them are still active, useful pieces today. So um, really it's one of those, like basically it's, it's like any other uh, investment approach. Um, if you're investing in running backs, you got to expect them to be short-term assets. You can't expect them to be, long-term assets because uh, they take the most bar and tear. And in today's NFL, you know, they break down. So um, again, from that list, we had, uh, we had Gordon, we had uh, well, from a, a new list that included rookies uh, from 2015. We had Gurley, we had Gordon, we had Bell who uh, are still productive today, but the other seven um, have fallen off either considerably or are no longer in the league. Um, I think Santi's point was he was comparing that to some of the QBs and wide receivers where even at that top with Luck or uh, Stafford or otherwise, um, those players are still not top five at their position, but they're still holding some value. So um, I think the point that Santi was making was uh, the insulation of positions at QB and receiver uh, holding off a little bit more. Um, the rapidity that running back degrades, but I think for any of us in, in dynasty leagues understand the importance of the running back position um, to the success of your team, especially from a week to week basis. So a little bit of back and forth on that right now. But uh, again, for those of you in chat who are likely following, um, you know, nothing you want to too surprised about, but Brian, thank you. I've been trying to monologue here for a while. I'm glad to have some company. Yeah, no problem. I find, I find your point of the, uh, talking about Lewis's debate here. Very interesting. Uh, one thing I've been looking at since this has been brought up is the the age of the position as it's like changed. So we had like our last big renaissance of running backs back in like 2008. Mm-hmm. And so in 2014, there are already six years of experience in the league. And I think, I think the point Santi's making is the longevity of, of uh, wide receivers just overall. Um, compared to running backs, and I I could agree to that to some, but I feel like if you were to invest in a running back for three years now, 
there's probably no better time to do that to to trade for a top 10 running back than like this year and last year because of how young all these really good running backs are and i think the nfl game's changing a bit where they're actually utilizing running backs in multifaceted ways instead of just running with them they're throwing the ball to them they're you know using them almost like bell cowish but more in creative ways than just pounding them down the the throat of the defense no exactly and if you look at the way that they were being used then um i would almost say that maybe they have a little bit more longevity in them now because of of how they're being used but maybe not uh there's only so many uh Sheldon brown hits that reggie bush can take before he starts breaking down um i think you actually know exactly the hit i'm talking about and anyone watching probably knows as well um but that being said uh the wear and tear of running into a, a line and four yards in a cloud of dust uh that he they've been doing from the four years in high school the three to four years in college and then um however long they make it in the nfl at some point you just you start breaking down from continuous wear and tear and uh the car crash level of um of you know exposure your body takes so mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. I get it. You know, they're going to keep going back and forth because that's how, so uh, Lewis and Santee are. They're kind of like cats and sacks at times. Um, but that being said, uh, it's it, it's fun to have a little bit of debate in, in the draft at this point because um, no one seems to want future fourths or fifths. So trading has died down a little bit. And um, we had a bit of a, a hold up uh, on the draft, but hopefully we are moving again here. Um, so, like I said, it's a little bit less to talk about than the last couple of days. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think the picks aren't nearly as glamorous where you're going to find like a lot to talk about that prospect because you know the defensive players are even getting thinned out. Besides maybe corners, um, you're getting like third string, second and third string defensive ends and linebackers now, and that's just not as glamorous. They're like the backbone of like building depth in this kind of league, but. In terms of being like overly productive players from week one is going to be real tough to find at this point. And I could, with the contract constraints that I think most teams are going through, um, there's just probably not going to be much trading until till a little bit later, to probably after the draft. Is my my thinking? Unless you keep making moves, I'm trying, and uh, I haven't stopped making offers, but. Uh... You know, it's it's there. There are a couple of deals which uh, seem relatively straightforward that just aren't happening. Um, but look, I mean, you know, my goal was to come out of this uh, this this draft with a couple of pieces to build on and to build up my draft capital. I think I've done that, and I've uh, given myself a little. I, I've got the cap room now that I want to be able to activate all of my taxi league mm -hmm. uh, players. So um, if I'm looking at rebuilding this team, because um, like I said, I made some pretty egregious mistakes in year one um i'm in a position to be able to do that now whereas uh if at the start of this draft we took it look at where this team was um i wasn't going to be uh very successful if i uh if i tried to rebuild the team um without making a, a major overhaul but uh that said i've gotten cheap in a couple of places and got rid of a lot of bad contracts but uh there's still plenty 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 of moves to be made my God, I'm looking at your draft capital for the next two years right now. Five firsts for next year, three seconds, two, three, four, four thirds, two fourths, and a fifth. And already in 2020, you have three firsts and two seconds. So, oh man, and you still probably now have enough draft capital if you wanted to start like in like a year. No, probably even sooner in the year, like by mid-season, start consolidating those to like try to move up after you kind of find out which teams are kind of stratifying into which tiers. That's probably going to be a very interesting time of the year for you because you'll be looking to, you know, even even just simple trades of like taking them on, but all you really want is to trade up or like move up around. That seems totally plausible now with all that capital you have. Well, the other nice thing is – um I have a nice little uh, cap penalty of $23 million this year, <laughs> which uh, should go down considerably based off of um, this year to next year. So between that, uh, the contracts I have coming off my cap, and then um, 
you know, what I'll have for next year. I should have plenty of space to take them on and then any uh, free agent players I would need to. So, um, uh, again, it's it's going to be a couple of years. I'm probably looking at 2020 before um, really going to be a player in this league. But that being said, um, oh, man. I've got a, a path forward versus, uh, you know, where I was at the end of the season where uh, I wasn't quite a contender and I wasn't quite rebuilding. So at 105, that's not the place you want to be. No, uh, true. Looking at your cap penalty for next year, you're going to have quite a bit that bounces back. Um, most of it's, you know, that uh, Paxton Lynch, good portion of that comes off your books. Uh, next year, I think you get most of your other big cap hits, like Simeon comes off, mm-hmm. Jamal Charles, Langford. So that's pretty good, too. You, like, cut players that aren't going to be huge cap hits even moving into next year, which means like free agency, you're going to have probably a good amount into there, into there to at least like almost instantly make your team better. Kind of like what I did this season where I had a bunch of cap room coming in into free agency and was able to get some pieces. And as long as you don't like put strap yourself to those like uh, contract years, like three or four year deals, by the time you get your draft picks picked up and you start like extending them, you'll have like that space to really maximize your potential off of that. So that's really cool too. Yeah. And, and I mean, you hit it on the head. Uh, I ended up picking up uh, Simeon in a uh, pick swap last year, um, thinking, hey, he could be a starter someplace. And I tried moving him over to the uh, the guy who owns Cousins, but I don't, I don't blame him for not wanting him for $14 million or, or $10 million or whatever he was. So um, again, the $5 million for him comes off. Um, Lynch was a bad decision in the startup. Um, I think there are quite a few folks right now who are looking at Lynch and saying, what the hell did I just do? Um, so, uh, he'll come down, I think to about 15% next year. So he's not completely gone, but, um, yeah, the, the big thing is, and then a couple of these could still come off this year. If Mark, if Brandon Marshall comes out and just straight up retires, um, that could come off when Parker is unsigned. So that's a million dollars that could become available. Um, and then a couple of others here, like Jamal Charles, that I believe is still unsigned, um, that could come off. So I still could end up with another $5 million this year based off of um, retirements. But that mm-hmm. said, uh, you know, I feel like my team is moving the right direction. And then um, now it's just a matter of, making sure I can keep making space for the rest of my draft picks so I can make these signings and, uh, you know, get ready get ready for this offseason when taxi uh, theft opens again. Yeah, um, agreed. And it'll be really great because you'll put these guys back on, which will probably get your, your cap hit or your um, cap room probably closer to the salary floor, um, meaning that if you make any deals in season – um, that cap space won't be affected by the floor until that next benchmark, which gives you a lot of flexibility to keep making deals. Um, so yeah, that'll be that'll be nice too. Yeah, and again, I think there's some some obvious uh, people I put on that taxi squad who I don't expect to be stolen, but if they are, I don't think I'm going to lose much sleep. Yeah, uh, if they are stolen, then that's just more money that's off your books um, while they might be productive. Man, that Josh talks in five years. Well, I mean, I saved a million dollars by uh, adding the three years to that contract. So um, I need to do that. And then there's still the potential of if it works out, renegotiate mm-hmm. one more time and that's good. If it doesn't, then, um, you know, it could be worse. Yeah, I, I, I did the same thing with uh, Corey Davis with him because he had such a high contract going into this year. I tried to shave off as much as I could by taking advantage of those uh, extension rules by like cutting, um, cutting like 15% off. And I figured, you know, getting that 15% off now will still make up for any extension. I'd probably have to pay if he hits later. And if he doesn't, then you just try to re- renegotiate midway through that next contract, to even lower his cap hit again. So yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah, but that being said, uh, gotta keep making these trade offers to see if there's anyone who's biting. Um, and again, gotta uh, flood Broncos with trade offers because 
uh, new owner, I mean, it's only right to welcome him to the league by uh, sending over about 500 different offers. It'd be crazy if he, like Blake Bortles, who he tr- who uh, Eagle Man traded for, Mike Williams, if he somehow, the new guy comes in, just turns around and trades these guys right away back to a different team after only being on the Broncos for like a week. Uh, I just find that hilarious if that was the case. Agreed. Um, yeah, and I think it would be um, it would be fitting if after some sweeping moves that uh, the Broncos made to, well, I don't know what they were doing. Um, <laughs> no, around and kind of reverse course and say, nope, I'm going to go this direction instead. So, um, look, I, I think uh, the last 24 hours have been a lot of fun for those of us to be uh, – to look back on what happened with the old Broncos and think, what the hell was that? But mm-hmm. I'm excited that uh, the Broncos seems to be fitting right into the culture of the league, and and uh, I think it's going to be a welcome addition. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a lot of you guys already know him, so that just means even more. I don't know him as well. I think he was he, he's in um, another league with a number of us, but left um, relatively early on. Um, but that said... Uh, some of the other candidates that we had on the books there, I don't think would have been as successful. So um, someone with a sense of humor, I think is going to be good. And someone who's not a uh, not actively attacking the other league members, I think is going to be good too. Yeah, I agree. It'd probably be a nice change of pace, especially for uh, Cardinals. He won't have to be defensive uh, or be berating someone. Um for calling, <laughs> you know, uh, a litany of uh, explicit names and phrases. What for really mean? no for really no reason. I can't even remember what he was upset about. There was a bit of a back and forth there. Um, I'll admit, uh, I did try and go after. I'm sure it's a surprise to nobody at this point looking at my team. Um, that Arizona first from the Broncos, and at some point I just quit because. There seemed to be something personal there, and there seemed to be a personal satisfaction of the Broncos owning that Arizona first, saying, ha, not only am I going to beat you, I'm going to be better than you, and therefore have a better first than mine would have been. So uh, at some point, like, y- you know when a deal is just not going to happen, and uh, mm-hmm. you back away from it. But uh, I, I got to say, it was it was interesting and uh, productive, I would say, dealing with former Broncos, and um, it'll be interesting to see the, the take that Bro- new Broncos takes on this league. Um, not only is first, you know, it's likely that he's going to want to compete, but there are definitely some moves that hamstrung his ability to do so that old Broncos made. So uh, it's going to be a question of can he do enough to sort of revitalize his, his team, or does he do what many do when they take over a team and go full tank? Well, I mean, his incentive to tank is has got to be gone for next year, right? That Z contract is such a such a liability. Um, Chargers hold, I think, a majority or at least a bunch of his draft capital for next year. I think I have some of it as well. I'm... Oh God! So, he, well, I guess he's got the first from. Cardinals, but that's slated to be a late one. And then he doesn't have a second. He's got Ian's third, Chicago's fourth, Washington's fourth, his own fifth, Chicago's – he's got a bunch of fifth-round picks, which – he's got four fifth-round picks. My God. And he at least retained his first for 2020. So uh, I guess he – Man, maybe just bite the bullet, see what your team does this year, and then next year you kind of like embrace the the full rebuild mode. That's right. As uh, as Andy posted for me, embrace the tank. Yeah, I mean, because then this season you still have McCoy, which if you don't trade him to like mid season to like really maximize any value that you get if after you see injuries and stuff like that. McCoy and Zeke will probably get him a couple wins if he can get some play out of his defense. Oh, that defense is bad, though. Um, doesn't have any wide receivers besides Mike Williams, but who knows what happens there. 
Yeah, I've already, uh, to no one's surprise, probably kicked the tires on Mike Williams to see if he's available. I think uh, there's definitely a, a longer view approach here. Yeah. Um, and again, I don't know much about Brian. I know that uh, the league I have been in with him has not had a salary cap aspect to it, so I don't know his level of experience on that side. But uh, <clears throat> it's going to be one that you know you learn quick, fast, and in a hurry. No, yeah. I mean, like he said, I was really appreciative of his um, his announcement when he like first got in here because he was getting probably bombarded by trades. Was a uh, standpoint that he isn't yet comfortable with the value assessment of players. And so most deals that come his way, he's probably going to be really conservative uh, and cautious about um, until he gets kind of comfortable. He's probably going to look through our transaction history, especially the last couple of weeks and kind of get a feel of where we evaluate a lot of these players uh, and positions, uh, which would probably be a great idea to kind of catch up soon. Um, so yeah <clears throat> so we'll see we'll see what the uh next couple <clears throat> days has to hold for us maybe he'll go on a vikings like uh splurge and start trading like crazy and uh that'll be fun but yeah. uh you know plenty of optionality there and uh it should be fun to watch but looks like titans are still on the clock um if i reload mfl here Yep, Titan's still on the clock. If I look at the site, uh, it's you, it's me, and uh, Lewis on the site. So um, doesn't look like he's on to be making the pick right now, but uh, we continue to wait. Uh, next five up are, um, like I said, the Titans on the clock at 407. Uh, Giants back-to-back -back at 408 and 409. Um, Colts at 410, Saints at 411, and Seahawks at 412. So um, we're in the midst of the fourth round right now. On ESPN, I think they'd be probably showing you a dancing monkey or something of that regard because, um, you know, it's, it's day three of the coverage and <clears throat> both Kuiper and McShay have lost their voice. Um, Lewis Riddick is, at, at this point, running out of things to say about people. And... Um, you know, really, they need to show as many human interest p pieces as possible because <laughs> I can only talk for so long. Yeah, human interest piece. That's exactly. We should probably do some human interest piece. We should probably get Ian in here to do a human interest piece. Uh, Matt, uh, probably just go down the line. You know, get Kim, the new people, Ronell, mm -hmm. uh, Brian, get all these human interest piece. Really dig deep into these new owners and uh, find out how they tick. So I think a great place to start would be um, the two R leagues in our two two of the R leagues in our uh, league. I don't know if you know this, Brian, but did you know the Ravens and the uh, Rams are brothers? Uh, I did not. Yes. So um, they're in a couple of other leagues with us. Uh, the Ravens um, and the Rams. Uh, the Rams are named either John or Doug. I mean, it, it's a bit of debate in terms of what his real name is mm -hmm. um but uh yeah he, his name uh is is doug wait uh whereas um the ravens is matt wait and they're brothers and uh they are in quite a few leagues together uh in one place at least co-owning a team um but in many cases in these dynasty leagues together so uh there's a little bit of sibling rivalry going on in our league as well you know i'd almost peg their sibling rivalry to be conjoined and be against Lewis uh, with the way they interact on chat. You just think those two are just diehard against... Actually, you know what? I, I say that, and probably 75% of the league has that behavior towards Lewis, it feels like. What? <laughs> I resemble that comment. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but either way, uh, so, you know, that, that's a good place to start. Uh so Ravens, um, so let, let's see. Uh, the, the Rams, actually, I think, just got married uh, end of last year. Um, and I believe the Ravens was his best fan. And um, there's a wonderful video, which if Lewis hasn't shared it with you guys yet, I, oh, I think he did. I'm asking for it, where um, going to the reception tent, uh, Matt 
the Ravens was very surprised by the quantity and quality of the desserts at the uh, reception tent. So um, had kind of a, a visceral and, um, you know, very just, just, you know, evolutionary response to the number of donuts in the tent regarding them is, wow, that's, that's a lot of donuts. <laughs> I mean, if you find good donuts, like we have a place here in Richmond that makes crazy great donuts and you kind of just get lost when you see something like that. Um, some, some sort of baked carb like that, that just tastes so good. That's got, you know, kind of just makes your day. And then, you know, when you're done, you kind of get in that real haze where you're digesting it and your body just doesn't know how to function anymore because there's just so much sugar. Mm. I'm sure that's what Matt's body just kind of, um, you know, un- subconsciously did on its own. Like, oh, my God, I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to process that. Just his reaction. To, so, you know, may- maybe, uh, Lewis, if he's listening to this pod, will post that donut, uh, Jeff, so everyone can appreciate it. But... Uh, Definitely, um, his uh, his reaction is is visceral and um, very uh, very well, blanking on the exact right word, but I'll say evolutionary. You know, that's not the right word I'm looking for. Um, to said donuts, but uh, that was just at the reception for the wedding. Um, but yeah, uh, going into the two, uh, there are a couple of rumors floating around around uh, the two brothers. One is. Um, that uh, Matt actually lives in a collection of cardboard boxes on Johnny's front lawn. So uh, this has not yet been confirmed or denied. Um, and honestly, <laughs> uh, Matt, as a cardboard ex- uh, expert, it seems, continues to feed this uh, this rumor. So um, it's sounding more true and true by the day. And uh, if so, uh, you know, it, it's very impressive that he's able to do the level of uh, team management he does while living in a collection of cardboard boxes, as even as impressive as that uh, cardboard box mansion sounds. Well, this might explain why we've had some issues with Matt trying to make picks sometimes throughout this draft, as maybe uh, Doug or Johnny isn't letting him utilize his internet at, ho- at his house, uh, being sure on the front not. lawn. He might only allow him to come inside and, and get on MFL very uh, restricted hours during the day. So, I mean... That might that might explain a lot. No, it makes sense. And again, it wouldn't be the first time that Doug's been that selfish. Um, but uh, you know, that's that's just part of the uh, the sibling process. I I do not have a brother. I have a sister, so I cannot speak to it firsthand. But truly, uh, you know, it's too bad that uh, that Doug is how he is. No, I'm, but you gotta sometimes keep that other sibling in line, like as. You have a sister. I have a sister as well, and sometimes you just gotta put your foot down and not let him, you know, be uh, be a hooligan, be an idiot. You gotta just keep them keep them in line, or else they will be on your front lawn in cardboard boxes. Yeah, and again, it seems like like you said, uh, maybe Doug acted too late on this one, and therefore, um, you know, he's paying the price for it here. Um, but I'd say that that's a first. You know, good human interest story is about the the two siblings, the uh, the owner siblings. Usually in the NFL, uh, a family will own a team. So in our NFL, it's interesting to have um, two siblings own different teams here. So uh, truly, um, our, our league has some stepping it up to do in terms of uh, their their prestige, and therefore um, the the level of ownership that has to be. Uh, crossed before you, you get a team in this league, but uh, you know that's something for us to continue to, to aspire to the next few years. Mm-hmm. <coughs> All right. So let's see. Uh, I'll, I'll ping the chat to see if there's any other uh, good facts or human interest piece on Matt and uh, and Doug. <laughs> I'll be back in one sec. No way.
Oh, and uh, checking on chat. Looks like uh, good news for those Rick and Morty fans. Um, looks like it has been extended uh, by 70 more episodes. So, um, again, expect to see them on the air for some time. And uh, the last going there. Uh, some, some good jokes, some good humor. Uh, not all the way through season three yet, but uh, definitely uh, a fun show to, to watch and keep up on. You watch Rick and Morty? I do, yes. What are your thoughts here? Is it too, uh, what's what's the word that uh, Patch just used? Is it too uh, snobby comedy, or uh, is it uh, still quite relatable? Um, I mean, it's, it's not like it's a clever comedy show, uh, unless, like, there are very rare points in it. It's kind of just very in-your-face, here's the comedy. Here, here's where you find it. Um, take it or leave it. Because I have plenty of friends that don't find it funny, but then you know, anyone who does just really enjoys it. Um, I just like it because it's so easy to watch. It's just such, a, such an easy show, and you can just find it humorous. And then the sci-fi element just makes it that much better. Because um, usually with any animated, you know, a comedy show, it, it just tends to be not have a lot of polish to it. Um, and this one just seems to have a bit more polish than what the other ones do, which I can appreciate. No, definitely. And uh, like I said, I enjoyed the first couple seasons. Um, I'm midway through season three still. I uh, haven't quite made it through, but um, as mentioned, I've got a little bit of free time on my hands, so uh, probably in the next couple of days I'll be able to take care of that. And they're nice and short, so it's not like you're wasting your entire day to watch all the rest of the episodes. No, exactly. And, and as I'm powering through Netflix series, at some point I'll run out on Netflix and I'll watch uh, Rick and Morty, and at some point I'll run out of Rick and Morty, and uh, I'll truly have to uh, look for other fun things to do. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Um, what else is there to discuss? So... Um, like I said, we had a bit of a run on corners taking place in that third round supplemental. Uh, I know that we were all kind of holding our breath and crossing our fingers to see how far those corners fell. Um, I think you were one of those teams. Um, is that about the point we were expecting those corners to start coming off the board, or is that uh, still a little bit early for your taste? No, that's uh, – they probably should have – they probably made, maybe should have been coming off the board around – 315 in my my uh thinking because they're going to produce more points right away most likely these top corners mm -hmm. around more than like chase Edmonds will or um maybe even some of these backup linebackers they, they're probably going to score you more points if you really need them it's kind of a matter of a, a value thing so if you need a corner or a young corner you might want to peg one right there um i thought about taking one very briefly at 312 Three thirty-two, even, mm -hmm. but I just kind of like Akram Wadley, just a, just as a personal pick. Like I liked the way I liked watching him play at Iowa. And I just felt like I might as well take him. He's one of the last offensive players that might actually see the field, um, especially after Lewis took Richie James. I really liked Richie James too, but yeah, this is probably the best place to take him, especially in these comp third round picks. Probably next year we'll see them more littered throughout the third rounds when there's not so many comp uh, compensatory picks. But uh, right now, that seems to be the perfect spot to grab them, especially like Josh Jackson. Um, Alexander seemed, if he turns out to be like a shutdown corner, like everyone says, he might only be really worth that one year of production. So if he's not, if he still like comes along really slowly, he might be, um, you know, he might give you more points in year two and year three. But that's the big problem I have with corners, um, value in general. Like, they might score a lot, a lot of points right away, but if they play really well, it's almost like to a detriment the next season. So, No, that's true. And, um, I mean, that's always the, the challenge with corners is you don't want the ones who are targeted and do a completely piss poor job because then you don't you know, get points. But you don't want them to be so shut down that they never get targeted. 
because while it's wildly effective for NFL teams, um, is less effective for us here. So um, I, I know NFL is crazy complicated with some of the scoring settings, but I don't think they have one for a uh, level of shutdown. Like, um, you know, if the number of targets is within this range or within this range. Um, but that being said, it's <clears throat> it's one where uh, we'll continue to be a challenge to balance. My question was, and look, I, I love both Jair Alexander and Josh Jackson. But I also like Kevin King, who they took at the top of the second round last year. So I'm curious in terms of how this all fits together. Because you've now spent top, say, 50 picks, I believe, on three corners over the last two years. You can never have enough. So I won't say it's a bad pick. But if I'm looking at how I'm trying to fit my lineup together, is that who, who fits in that nickel spot of the three? Is it Alexander? Is it King? King was kind of more that big physical outside corner. What kind of defense is being played if uh, if these are the guys were taken? So um, I know we've got a ton of uh, Packers fans who you know I'm sorry, but uh, I, you know aren't my favorite team as a Niners fan. But that being said, um, I'm not sure how this all fits together. So um, being a Packers fan, uh, my impression of how they plan on running this defense with Mike Pettine is. Um, Tremont Williams they re-signed as like their veteran caretaker of this really young uh, defensive uh, back unit. He'll he'll probably play to start the season uh, on the outside. Uh, they'll probably play Kevin King on the other side um, just because of his experience and how he's a bigger bodied athlete than um, Josh Jackson or Jair Alexander. I expect Josh Jackson to play more slot um, nickel. Um, coverage, and they'll probably rotate Jair Alexander in um, in interim spots or have both of them play in dime packages is my thought. Uh, then they also have Devon House, who I expect them to, to uh, slide in there quite a bit. Um, so it's not going to be real clear to begin with, um, which is going to be potentially hindersome for these guys producing year one. Um if they blow Tremont Williams out of the water, I could see uh, Jair Alexander going to the outside and Josh Jackson remaining in the slot. But um, yeah, that's what I think is probably going to happen uh, right now. No, I think there's there's some good logic to that. Um, but again, like I said, it's uh, it's good that they're spending the capital they need to to solidify the position. But um, I think there's still a long way of how this all plays out. Again, hopefully you hit on all three, but you're never quite sure. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to check this, this chat, and it doesn't seem like anyone's really outside of us clamoring to get into a chat today. So uh, have we run our course? Have we, uh, have we saturated the market with all these, uh, with all these pods? Uh, I don't know quite yet. I'm really kind of hoping – once this is all said and done, we have some like summation uh, chat on who we think did the best, what picks were the best value picks from groups impression. I just think that could be really fun after we get all like the whole body of work set up and talk about, you know, after because at that point, our pretty much our big off season uh, transactions have happened, and we'll have to see. I'd like to gauge who we think, like where the pe teams and their divisions rank out based on their drafting and based on their uh, their free agency and what they did. So that'll be, I think that should should definitely happen. Oh no, definitely. There's going to be a wrap up cast at some point. Um, but again, we've been doing this almost daily. Um, we did again with Friday, and then uh, basically from Sunday on. Um, I think it's just a question of. I guess it's our sixth cast that we've done since we started with the fourth round. Um, are we running out of steam? And uh, when, when's the next one after this? Like, wh when do we finally uh, hang it up and say, no more, you know, it is what it is? I, uh, <laughs> with the pace of, oh my gosh, how many more picks we have that are fourth and fifth rounders? I just, <laughs> oh, we just, we just did have two picks. They'll go. Um, so, really, did, did uh, Lions finally pick? 
Lions pick, Titans picked, and the Giants just picked, and we're waiting on the Giants again. Um, and if they pick, which you know, hopefully they. Oh, well, he did do a pre-draft, so maybe we'll oh, see. Oh no! The Seahawks have back to back, and the 49ers are. Oh, we're gonna stall on the 49ers again. Oh, at four fourteen, unless he's pre-drafted. Uh, I don't think he did. No, he's not. At least Matt. Matt uh, of the Ravens pre-drafted at 416, so uh, as long as no one takes his guy. They probably will. <laughs> All right, it looks like uh, the Chargers is out of commission today. So where did yesterday did they leave off on the picks? Um, so pick wise, we left off right at the beginning of the supplemental round. Um, I had traded uh, three thirty five to the Chargers right before I kind of ducked out. Mm -hmm. um, but then, if you look at from a when the picks from a perspective, um, the last pick made well, we had the active cast was around that um, let me get it here uh, 337 point where uh, Chargers took Speaks, Packers took Bates, and the Jags took uh, Kishi uh, and that, well I mean before Kishi there's a four hour break between the Packers at 6 o'clock and the Jags at 10 o'clock I really like that um, Titans pick of um, Sanat uh, D tackle out of Atlanta. I like that pick too. I also like the Raiders Chad Thompson pick. He could be decent since they didn't take Chubb. Otherwise, it's pretty. Uh... <laughs> Boy, I think is Jaleel Scott like the last wide receiver that you could possibly take at this point in the draft? No, because I took a wide receiver at uh, my next pick, so. Oh, you did? Oh, you did, Alan Lazard. Okay. Boy, maybe they just an ever ending list of wide receivers in this class, just none of them were. All that amazing. Oops. There's another one. Yeah, there's probably there's probably a couple more. They'll probably be taken. All right. Well, that said, um, I'm no. I know we could keep this going for another uh, very long time, but I think we'll probably keep it short today, just because we don't have the content, we don't quite have the speed in draft. Uh, we can maybe open it up again a little bit later, but uh, keep it short today, and then hopefully have a little bit more to talk about tomorrow. So, uh, mm -hmm. any closing thoughts before we uh, we close out a little bit early today? No, that's uh, pretty much. Uh... I just have to gather some more human interest piece for tomorrow. It's true. So if you have a human interest piece to talk about for uh, a team within uh, the league or otherwise, please let us know because we're looking for content so that uh, it's not just us doing uh, cooking recipes or otherwise the entire time. <laughs> All right. Well, Brian, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll talk tomorrow. And everyone else, enjoy. But uh, this is – the cast for today, and uh, you all suck for not joining. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. See you, Mike. Peace.